Hello, everyone. I am Corey Lee, and thank you so much for tuning in to a brand new episode of Access All Areas by Home Discover. Uh, tonight, I am talking to a very special guest. I'm going to be talking with Julie Jones of Have Wheelchair Will Travel. It's a phenomenal wheelchair accessible travel blog based in Australia that covers worldwide destinations. Um, so I can't wait to introduce her and uh, learn all about her family's amazing adventures. So let's get right to it. And hi, Julie. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Thanks so much for having me. Really yeah, excited or, to be with you. Yeah, or this morning, I should say, you're in Australia, so it's a whole different day for you. <laughs> it sure is. We're a bit a day ahead of you. Yep. <laughs> Um, I, as I was saying, your blog is one of the first blogs that I even stumbled upon. Like once I started this blogging journey, it's been a huge inspiration for me. And uh, I've loved following your adventures in Australia and worldwide. I know that you've been to the States, you've been across Asia and the Pacific. So we definitely have a lot to talk about tonight. But can you first start out by telling us just a bit about yourself and about your blog, Have Wheelchair, Will Travel. Sure. Well, I um, enjoyed a career in the travel industry before my son was born and actually even after he was born. And when he was born and over time, it was a period of time before we realised that he had cerebral palsy. Um, it, it was sort of this feeling of, oh, we've just got to do therapy. And, you know, we were really involved in that kind of world for a long time. And then we really missed traveling and we'd always imagined that we traveled the world with our children and we didn't want a wheelchair to hold us back and all the different things. So we started making tentative steps. We did a cruise, which seemed like an easy way of traveling as a first step. And we did lots of local travel. And then in 2011, we actually won a trip to Disneyland. And that was probably the most liberating feeling because after that trip, we saw what that meant to the children, what it meant, how it bonded my son, Brayden, with his sister, Amelia, how we all enjoyed the same things there. And the wheelchair, you know, required more planning and research, but it was all possible. And when we came back, I was telling friends about it and being, in, you know, having a travel background, I'd really researched every tiny detail. So it was a very smooth trip for us. And so it just didn't seem like that was enough. So somebody said, why don't you start a blog? And so we started the blog and kept it quite impersonal because I felt like people just wanted the travel information. They didn't care about the people, you know, behind the blog. But over time, we built a real community and have wheelchair world travel. And we really found that people wanted to know us. And part of knowing us was gaining their trust that the information we provided was going to help them. So now we have some of our readers contact us and say, you know, their sons who are perhaps a bit younger than Brayden or daughters will say, oh, well, if, you know, he can do it, we can do it. And, you know, we know that it gives not just the adults but some of the kids confidence to travel as well. Yeah, so exactly. it's just kind of grown from there. Yeah, it's definitely grown a lot. I know you've embarked on even... New, new ventures like a magazine, which we'll definitely delve into later on in this interview. But um, you mentioned that you were a travel agent before starting the blog and having children. So what were your travels like before having kids and what adventures did you were you able to go on before having kids? And how, I guess, did that process change once you had a child with a disability? So before um, we had children, well, when I, I should start back at where I guess my love from travel came from. My mum and dad took me travelling to Europe for six months when I was nine years of age. And that was, was at a time when people weren't really leaving their jobs and becoming nomad, nomadic travellers and things like that. So it was sort of that they were a bit ahead of their time in doing that. And that really cemented my love for travel being, you know, all around Europe and Egypt and Scandinavia and all those countries and always wanted to do the same with my kids but then working in the travel industry I was very privileged because obviously we had access to very cheap airfares or free trips which was fantastic so my husband and I you know would fly to Europe for three weeks and we'd grab a car and we'd just stop here there and everywhere on a whim um, and it was all very fast-paced so 
I think probably one of the advantages of having Braden in our life has forced us to slow down. I certainly appreciate everything so much more. I don't take travel as something, I don't take it for granted. I realise it is a privilege and it should be considered, I think probably after COVID, more people understand that travel really is a privilege. Um, you know, if you've had something taken away from you or unsure about how you'll do it, which is how I felt when Brayden was born, um, it really makes you just take in every moment of travel. So we definitely have slower travel. We research a lot more. We still try and have spontaneity in our travels, but we definitely find planning and research makes smoother travels. Yeah, for sure. I completely agree with that. That's the probably the number one thing I always say is to do as much research as possible in advance, because then when you're actually at the destination, you can fully enjoy it instead of having to like, you know, figure it all out while you're there as far as accessibility goes anyway. So it's definitely a process, but well worth it. And um, yes. to, to delve away from travel for a second, um, I would love to talk more about your son's disability. And when your son was diagnosed with cerebral palsy, what was that initially like for you and your husband? Um, how did you eventually get to the point where you were accepting it and, you know, decided to show him as much of the world as possible? I mean, you guys look like rock star parents now. I mean, you're showing your kids the world. So how did you go from the initial diagnosis to, you know, showing him the world? Well, I guess we had a period where we weren't sure whether he had a disability or not. There was sort of a question mark of, you know, will physio just bring him up to, you know, age-appropriate milestones when he was about five months of age? That's when we started to get that question mark. Um, and then when he got the diagnosis, I think I'd been so tired of being in this, is there a problem, isn't there a problem? I just really wanted to get onto, onto everything. And I became a bit of a woman possessed. I don't know, my husband probably absolutely hated the process because I was just so therapy based and we certainly had Braden doing every bit of early intervention because that's what all the research says is so important. And then one day a therapist said to me, you know, it's actually okay to have a holiday, to take a break from therapy because often kids learn to consolidate all the things they've been learning if they get a break from it. And so when we go on holidays, Brayden had to go into a standing frame every day for about an hour to um, make sure that he, you know, I get bear, was bearing weight. And so we would just dig a hole in the sand and he would play with his sand toys while he was standing up in the sand. So that was the way we'd take therapy on the road with us, but we'd still have a holiday. So we felt like that was a a good compromise, but it did take us a while to have the confidence to travel, um, A, from the point of view of guilt of not doing therapy, and B, just wondering how we were gonna do everything, um, particularly once a wheelchair became part of our world, because that was sort of a bit of a, a mind block for me of how we were gonna fly with a wheelchair. And I think the world has evolved quite a lot. Brendan's 25 now. And when we go to check in, I don't have to explain everything that we need now. We find that the airlines tend to know. It's always good to double check. But back in the early days, we were, you know, really had to walk them through where to stick the baggage tag on his wheelchair, the fact that we needed his wheelchair right to the door of the aeroplane. So it's, um, there's been positive changes, that's for sure. Yeah. And you guys are really lucky, I think, to live in Australia where, you have Qantas Airlines. I think they're like one of the best airlines for wheelchair users in the world. And then um, also things like the Eagle Lift, which is something that we yes. have in the U.S. So right, yeah, and it's look. I have not tried it personally yet, but it looks incredible for getting on the airplane. Is that something that Braden uses to get on the airplane? We're very fortunate. Braden can actually walk with assistance. So he, we will use his wheelchair to the door of the aircraft and then he'll walk down to his seat with us assisting him. Um, but I know from talking to other wheelchair users who are maybe um, have paraplegia, they say it's the most comfortable way to get a transfer to the seat because the actual eagle lift goes down between the aisle, like in the aisle, yeah. and the person's in a hoisted situation and then it's just placed into the seat. So it's certainly good. And, I mean, the A380s that the Qantas 
were using, say, between here and the US, they had um, wheelchair accessible bathrooms as far as they were a bigger than usual cubicle. So that's, you know, I know that you've written about it on many occasions, the challenges that associated with flying a long haul and not having appropriate bathroom facilities. And I find it quite astounding that we're in 2021 and we're still talking about it. You know, we're flying Paralympic teams all around the world and yet we still don't have every flight with an accessible bathroom on it. Yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, we could probably talk about the inequalities when it comes to air travel for hours. I mean, it, we definitely still have a long way to go, but luckily there are companies that are working to change that. I know All Wheels Up is a great one. Um, they're trying to make it possible where wheelchair users can actually stay in their wheelchair on flight. So maybe- I think we'll also the more we talk about it, the better there it is because yeah. people don't know what they don't know. So if you're a regular passenger on a flight, you probably are not even considering what a wheelchair user needs. And that was me when, you know, before Brayden was born, I will say that I was ignorant to a lot of the things that I have learned either through having him or having my community and, you know, people telling me that they starve themselves before a flight, they don't drink on a flight because they're just so scared of needing to use a restroom. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we have, a question from Annette. She says, um, I know you have flown to LA a couple of times. Any recommendations for long haul trips? I think my, my best recommendation is working out, A, what time of day suits you best. So for us, Braden sleeping on the long haul flights is a very big challenge. Flying with airlines that will, you know, like Qantas, we found they do their best to give us bulkhead seats. Um, which makes a big difference to the space Braden has. And for us assisting him with food, for us assisting him to transfer, to walk down to the bathroom, things like that. So that makes a big difference. If you can break a trip instead of doing it as a big long haul flight, you know, we'd never fly to the UK, for example, from here, because that would be 22 hours and that just wouldn't be manageable for any of us. So we would stop on the way. We're even thinking if we flew back to the States now, whether we would break the journey in Hawaii. Um, the only problem with that is that the larger aircrafts don't tend to do that route. So I think you have to work out what's best. I know a lot of people have challenges on flights with um, people who are incontinent and trying to change them in privacy and, and things like that. I think open communication with the airline We've never found an airline that hasn't been accommodating once we've really explained to them what we need. Um, so I think all those things just prepare as much as possible. And as you'd know, preparing your, your wheelchair is super important because if you get to your destination and your wheels are broken or, you know, damaged in any way, that's not a good start to a trip. Yeah, definitely a rocky start to any trip if your wheels are broken. So yeah, um, yeah, anything to prevent that from happening, I'm all over it. And yeah. uh, what were some of the first destinations that you all traveled to as a family once Braden started using a wheelchair? And what did you learn from those early travel experiences? So I always tell people to do what we did, which is to start local, because I think you really learn what you can do without and what you have to have, you know, packed. And I think road tripping is a pretty easy way because you can throw all those extra bits and pieces into the car <laughs> that you might not be able to do a flight. We also did a cruise and cruising probably isn't my preferred way of travel because I like to see a lot of things and just being at ocean, like seeing the ocean from Australia, it's a long way to get to any destination um, so you've sort of got days at sea, which to me doesn't particularly appeal. But for Brayden, I could see the advantages. You know, my husband and I could go for dinner. We didn't have to unpack, repack everything. We were able to take more equipment with us. So that were the that were the two sort of big first trips we did. And then when Brayden was little, we used to carry him in a back carrier. Oh. And I think a lot of people put off their travels. But we did some trips in Australia that we wouldn't actually be able to do with him now as a wheelchair user. Um, so we've pivoted. So when he was up to the age of seven, my husband, Mark, would carry him in a back carrier. We would climb up to the top of, you know, mountains or whatever we wanted to do. Now we will catch a helicopter um, 
to do the similar things. So it's just a matter of evolving as your needs evolve, I think is probably one of my best tips, not trying to hang on to how perhaps if you weren't a wheelchair user before and now you're suddenly a wheelchair user or have a child who's, you know, transitioning to a wheelchair, I think you just need to evolve your thinking and not hang on to the way you used to do it because it's not necessarily possible to do it anymore. Yeah, exactly. It's all about adapting. I think when you travel with a wheelchair, you have to constantly be willing to adapt to any new situations or new um, terrain or whatever it may be when you're traveling. So it's definitely a process and you just have to be, I think, patient and willing to accept kind of whatever comes your way, I always say. And I'm not sure how you book your travel, but we tend to book our travel, not necessarily we don't say have, for example, Athens on our list as, oh, we have to go to Athens. We might look generally and see which countries we feel would give Braden the best experiences and things that we could all do as a family. So, for example, Fiji is not the most accessible, like physically accessible destination. If you compare it to, say, the US, where you have that ADA guidelines and laws and there's ramping and there's, you know, lifts and everything else, Fiji doesn't have that. But what they do have is a people who are so inclusive that they make sure that you can do everything you know we'd get off a boat and there'd be sand and there'd be suddenly a fijian running to push Braden, you know across the sand to make sure he could still get to the resort and things like that and so i think that willingness to be inclusive makes a huge difference as well yeah amazing fiji has been on my list of places to visit for years so you have to do it on that photo of Braden and Fiji I was like oh my god like, I want to go there so bad yeah <laughs> I've got to do it but um since those first travels do you think that the world has improved for wheelchair users and what would you still like to see improved I know that you briefly mentioned you know air travel definitely still has a long way to go but is there anything else that you think needs drastically improved as well? I think one of the major problems we have right around the world, although I'd actually say the US probably is far more enlightened than other areas of the world um, as far as because of the ADA. I think the ADA has, I know it's still not perfect, but I think the ADA has brought about an awareness um, because we find that in the US we don't necessarily have to explain what we need as much. But I do a lot of, um, as a travel writer, I do a lot of hotel inspections in Australia and in other countries when I travel. And what I do find is people have very much a, a blanket idea of what a wheelchair user needs. And they don't understand that like every other traveller, there is a variety of needs. So whether it's an individual travelling with a support worker, whether it's like us where we're helping our son, um, you know, there's just so many different needs because I'm sure you know when you arrive with an aid or a support worker you don't necessarily want an accessible double bedded room with no room for a roll away for example so yeah. you know we really need that education that people come in all kinds of um, combinations when they have a disability it's not just one you know one thing and it's not even just wheelchair users you know mm -hmm. when I go to expos and talk to families who have kids on the autism spectrum their needs are so different from our needs. Um, but, you know, whatever you need when you travel, everyone looks forward to a holiday. We yeah. need to make sure it goes as well as possible. And I think understanding and a bit more education would go a long way. Yeah, completely agree. The word accessible, it means something different to every disabled person, I believe. So, I mean, the quicker we can get hotels and businesses to realize that there's not a one-term definition for the word accessible i mean and be more inclusive then the better off we'll be for sure I completely agree with you on that and um what are some of your family's favorite experiences that you've had while traveling you've been to disney you've been to fiji you've been all over australia so if you could only choose a top like two or three what would your top few be well, I think Disneyland would have to be up there because that was our first experience and I just remember that absolute high of coming back and having done it and the photos of the kids just looking, you know, couldn't have looked happier. Um, and the staff at Disneyland just really make it something very special. Franz Joseph Glacier, the trip we did to um, 
the glacier was amazing. We did a helicopter flight to the glacier. Um, and what made that very special is there's a company in New Zealand called Making Tracks and they are working with businesses to make sure that they're inclusive by adapting equipment. And they've got this amazing sit ski. So when you get to the top of the glacier as a wheelchair user, if you're able to transfer out, you can experience the glacier um, just like anyone else, really. I mean, I think Braden probably had even more fun than people just walking on the glacier, to be honest, as he was zipping back and forwards in the sit ski. But, you know, things like that. Fiji, I mean, that stands out just because I think Braden's so, Braden's nonverbal. Um, and the Fijian people are just so warm and so welcoming that I think he just felt, felt like he'd found his tribe. You know, everywhere he went, people were, you know, giving him a buller and a hug and, a, you know, for him that's just amazing. And, and travel is, for Braden such a great social outlet because when you're nonverbal, day-to-day people are busy, they don't tend to take the time. But when you're travelling... There's something about sharing an experience where strangers suddenly begin to talk to you and share things that they wouldn't normally share if they were just on their local bus service or, you know, whatever. But when you're all in that situation, it breaks down barriers that are normally there, I think, in day-to-day life. Yeah, absolutely. Those sound like some incredible experiences and I love the photo of Braden and the Sitsky. That just looks like the most fun thing that I can imagine. So yeah, I've, I've not done that yet. I'm going to have to one day. And, yeah, uh, for sure. Some viewers tuning in. Uh, your picks are amazing. Glad to see you guys are enjoying life. Thanks, Sandy. Uh, Annette says, your beach trips show that Australia does such a great job of accessing the water. I think better than the U.S., Oh, I think that's a tricky one because the US, and I know, Corey, you have done um, the uh, power wheelchairs or the electric wheelchairs on the beach, which I know for somebody like yourself that's normally an independent wheelchair user, you may not want to be pushed by somebody else. Uh, I think Australia's rolled out a lot more, perhaps. Um, And what we're now getting in Australia is a variety of beach wheelchairs, which I think is showing that there's beginning to be some understanding of there's no one size fits all for people with disability. Right. So recently we went to a beach in Sydney and they had the power wheelchair. Then they had, um, I don't know whether you've got the photo of Braden on a beach in a more upright beach wheelchair, which is called a sand cruiser. And that's Braden's beach wheelchair, which is a sand cruiser. And then there's another beach wheelchair called a hippocamper, um, which is a little bit more reclined. So Braden actually sits very well. But for some people who don't sit so well, I think it's um, great to have something a little bit more reclined so they can still enjoy the beach. So I think we really need to get this, you know, again, it's the same message, I guess, educating the tourism industry and the world in general that there is no one size fits all. Yeah, exactly. And um, you've talked a little bit about your favorite experiences, but are there any experiences or travels that stand out as not so great? And how did you deal with that? I know like, you know, whenever I'm traveling, I'm kind of always prepared for something to go wrong because I mean, I think traveling as a wheelchair user it's very easy for things not to go 100% correctly. So um, is there a destination or an experience that just didn't turn out how you thought it would be? Well, I always say to people, if you expect everything to go smoothly with travel in general, then you probably should stay at home because I think even as a a traveller without a disability, you know, flights run late and things like that. Um, I think things like having not having Braden's own wheelchair not showing up at the door of the aircraft. Airlines don't realise how um, uncomfortable those aisle chairs, do you call them aisle chairs in the States? The the airline provided wheelchairs are. So that's not a good start for him when he gets to a destination and he's uncomfortable in an aisle chair instead of his own chair. So things like that annoy us. We've only ever, touch wood, had Braden's wheelchair damaged once and it was only the wheel guards on his wheel. So that was pretty good. And the airline, like they paid for those very quickly. Um, Aside from that, my biggest frustration is booking. I find it very, very hard to sometimes, you know, you'll really quiz people on the accessibility of a destination and then they might say something like, oh, there's only a step up 
and you think to yourself, well, you have no idea what accessible is right. because <laughs> with Brayton's wheelchair, we can actually bump it up a, a step. But if we're staying in a hotel for a long time, we don't want to bump it up a few stairs every day because it's not good for us, you know, our bodies to do that and it's not comfortable for him. So that's my biggest frustration, the lack of understanding of what truly is accessible and the need to constantly check. You know, so many people can go onto booking platforms and just book a room, whereas we wouldn't, well, our family would never do that. We'd always contact the hotel direct. And sometimes it's really hard, you know, with, with chains like Sheraton, for example, you get a, a toll-free number in another country where they're not even the hotel. So if you don't actually research and get the number for the Sheraton, say in Chicago, and speak to the manager or staff in the hotel that know the rooms and know the layout, you may end up arriving and it's not what you need. Yeah, exactly. I've been there many, many times calling and they're not even at that hotel and have no idea. So that's one of the reasons why I love working at Home Discover is because they actually scout wheelchair accessibility in a number of hotels and resorts. And um, if anyone watching wants to go to homediscover.com, you can browse through accessible listings and find a hotel in many, many countries. There are some in Australia, the US, all over Europe, um, all around the world. So um, yeah, one of the reasons why I love working with Home Discover and was thrilled to talk with you tonight here on the Home Discover uh, Access All Areas. And um, also another question for you, what is your top tip for other travelers that use wheelchairs if you could only choose i guess the one most important tip what would it be i know you, you are a wealth of knowledge and could probably list you know 20 different tips but if you could only pick one i think probably for us is the design of the wheelchair for starters so before we're even traveling when Braden's getting a new wheelchair, we're building in storage, we're bu building in facilities that are going to make it good for us to travel. Um, so he has off-road wheelchair, off-road tyres that are like a BMX um, or off-road bike um, tyre that can go onto his wheelchair. So if we're going off-roading, like say at Uluru, for example, we would use that. That's actually a trail rider, the picture that's up now. So I don't know whether you've got those so much in the US. I know Canada has them um, and these are like a, a, they describe it as a wheelbarrow wheel and you have people that guide it so you can go off track. But um, that's something that we can hire or borrow for free at national parks, which is amazing. So that's Braden in a, a, a rainforest in New South Wales. So without that, we probably would have found it very difficult to get him to the rainforest floor. But we've taken him on some quite fabulous adventures in national parks. But getting back to the wheelchair, when we get it designed, we actually have a pocket under his um, seat, which is zippered. And so his legs are over the top of that. That's fantastic for hiding passports, money, things like that in it. Um, we have a zippered pocket at the back so we can have wallets and keys and things that are easily accessible, um, your room key, those sorts of things just in there. So for security, it's really good. We have the option of the off-road tyres for his wheelchair. Um, We've also, he has a Superman graphic on the side of both his armrests of his wheelchair, which are a great talking point, again, because he's yeah. nonverbal. People, when we travel off and want to talk to him about something and they're not sure what to talk to him about. And just making the, the wheelchair for us as light as possible. But obviously for power wheelchair users, it's a whole different ball game. But I'd say your chair being your legs really when you get to a destination it's about preparing it before you leave taking a repair kit um, putting a sign on your wheelchair basically telling people how to use it particularly power wheelchairs we put a picture of Braden on it as well to personalize it so people don't just think of it as a piece of equipment they actually realize that it's something really important to somebody right. so if I only have to pick one it's all about the wheelchair <laughs> Yeah, I think the the idea of showing the photo of Brayden on the chair is tremendously important because a lot of times, you know, when we're flying, they just see a piece of equipment and don't really associate that as being someone's legs, essentially. So putting a face to the equipment definitely helps, I believe, and that's a really great tip that you mentioned. 
So thank you. Well, for I think that. we all have to remember that airlines run on such a tight schedule and they have these exactly. windows to get in and out. Everyone's on such tight um, scheduling. So baggage handlers, you know, if you don't personalise it, they, you know, they're likely to be rough with it because they're just under pressure. Yes, exactly. And the trail rider looked amazing. So it's available in national parks within Australia for free. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Wow. And okay. there's actually a um, there's a park in uh, Victoria where they also provide Sherpas, they call them, so guides. So, for example, say you were travelling with your mom, she, it's a nice way of having two people help at the front and the back and her just being your companion instead of her actually trying to manage the trail rider as well, which I think is really nice because it opens it up to everyone. Yeah, I've got to get back to Australia. I missed out on all this when I went. <laughs> It's sure do. Long, yeah. A long list, Corey, a long list. Yeah, definitely. I went in 2014 and did Sydney and Melbourne um, and the Great Ocean Road, but so much more of Australia to see for sure. <laughs> and um, post-COVID, once this pandemic finally ends, if it ever does end, um, what is on the top of your family's travel bucket list? Oh, if you ask my daughter, Fiji is on the top of her list. Um, we were hoping to get to South Africa. We're really interested oh, yeah. in getting to South Africa because there's such a wide variety of experiences there. We'd love to get back to the States. We'd love to do, you know, more like a six-week road trip where we sort of saw a lot more. Every time we've been there, it's about three, three weeks or something like that, and it's just not enough, really. So, Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah some really good destinations there. And your daughter, you've... You've raised her well if Fiji is at the top of her bucket list. So Yeah, she absolutely loved it. And I think because we didn't actually stay, there's an area of Fiji where there's sort of all the Sheratons and, and big hotels, which is lovely, but we actually stayed in an Airbnb villa outside of the main area. So we really got a feel for local life, which was really interesting. It's not often you sort of see somebody walking down the street with a machete or all the Fijian men in their Sulus on Sunday with their Bibles heading off on the bus to um, church. So it was really interesting to see. Yeah, that sounds amazing. And um, you also, in addition to your travel blog, Have Wheelchair Will Travel, you uh, launched a magazine a couple of years ago called Travel Without Limits. Can you tell us where the inspiration for that came from? And can you please let everyone know how to subscribe to the magazine. Sure. Well, I had started writing, I had started the blog and I was very excited to be writing the blog, but I did feel that there was a real lack of representation of travellers with a disability travelling in any tourism advertising, any mainstream media. It was just kind of like we didn't exist, like we weren't part of the travel market. Um, and... I guess I had started to write for mainstream magazines, but it was one story in an issue, you know, about our experience. But our experience is, you know, very different to, for example, your experience of travelling as an adult who's independent, you know, to a degree um, with this, with support. Um, it's different to somebody who's a, who may be blind or travelling with somebody who uh, has autism or is deaf. And I really felt there needed to be a broader spectrum. So as much as I was happy writing for mainstream travel, I felt like we needed to have more people with lived experience yeah. telling stories. We don't need journalists. I mean, it's fine for journalists to include the information, but they just don't have the experience. And, and I think for you and I particularly, when we read a story, we want to have that trust that somebody has experienced it and somebody's got the knowledge of what's needed, what information another traveller might need. So we started with a very small issue of the first Travel Without Limits magazine. Um, we're currently up to our fifth issue and it's, I think, more than tripled in size. It's now a really glossy um high quality magazine which I'm really proud of because I feel like that's what's deserved by you know people with a disability looking for tourism opportunities and every story in there is written by somebody with lived experience so you've been a fabulous contributor sharing your experiences across the globe um, and we've got you know 
some kids who write for us in the kids pick section which I think is really important to get that very fresh young approach to you know young travelers as well uh, so we're just trying to foster very much an inclusive community in the magazine and it's also showcasing to the travel industry exactly what people with a disability want can do um, you know, I think there's probably wheelchair users they probably put into a very sedate kind of travel category. Um, but, you know, when you see people whitewater rafting, when you see people going up Mount Kilimanjaro, you know, I think it will hopefully open up that conversation and bring about a bit of awareness as well. Yeah, and I will say um, your magazine, Travel Without Limits, is one of the most well done magazines I've ever seen. I mean, the quality of the pages, it's very, very well done. It is a fabulous magazine. So anyone that is watching, definitely subscribe to it at travelwithoutlimits.com.au. And um, you guys do ship worldwide. That is correct. Yes, we do ship well, well. And and just a little hint for people, there's somebody very special on the cover with his mom on the next issue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a, just a little hint there, a little preview. Yeah. For the, yeah, I'm very excited for that. And hopefully everyone will subscribe to be able to see that when it comes out soon. So um, thank you so much for talking with me tonight, Julie. Is there... Anything else that you would like to say? And can you please let know or let people know where they can find you and connect with you and your family online? Sure. Well, I just say to people, get out there and give it a go. Do your research, do some planning and use all the resources that are out there. You know, Corey's blog, my blog, we're all trying very hard to open up this world and, and to give people the confidence to travel and you know, it's so rewarding when you do do it. I'm sure, you know, you would agree, Corey, that it's kind of one of the best things in life is coming back from a trip and the friendships that you make and the experiences that you have oh, yeah. um, are fantastic. Just go with a positive attitude and remember things do go wrong, but how you react to it, I think, determines the outcome at the end. So that's really important. But you can connect with us. We've got a really thriving Facebook community, very... Um, engaged and I guess willing to help and share um, at Facebook Have Wheelchair Will Travel, the blogs have wheelchairwilltravel.net and obviously we've got travelwithoutlimits.com.au. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much, Julie. I definitely learned a lot, loved hearing your story and I can't wait to finally meet up with you in person, hopefully very soon. <laughs> You'll have to come back out here, Corey. Yeah, I would love to, hopefully soon. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You. Uh, have a great night. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you all so much for watching. Um, I really appreciate you tuning in to this episode of Access All Areas. And we will be back in a few weeks with a new guest. And I uh, look forward to you joining us then to hearing their story as well. So thank you all so much and have a great week. See you later. Bye.